Oh, we are going to be talking specifically about specific immunity, and we're going to start with adaptive or specific immune defenses related to B cells and antibiotic mediated, mediated immunity. So at this point, we have had the first line of defense come into play and it has failed. So pathogens have entered the body and we have had our second line of defense with our non-specific immunity come into play and fail to control it. So our leukocytes have failed to control the infection. Our inflammatory responses failed to control the infection. Complement has failed to control it. And um, interferon, if it's viral and fever. And so now we need something specific. And so need to talk about some terminology before we can start putting things to work. So when we're talking specific defenses, we're it's like the special forces in the military. And in this case, we're talking specifically B cells and T cells. And they are unique in that they can recognize specific antigens because they have specific receptors for those antigens, okay? So each B cell has receptors that a specific antigen can bind to. So there's like a million different kinds of B cells with specific receptors that are, and antigens can only bind to B cells that have their receptors. <clears throat> so each cell only has one type of receptor and it must fit into it. Um, so it's kind of like the key has to find the lock that it fits into. The antigen must find its receptor. And so specific defenses has specificity. What does this mean? It means if the B cell or the T cell is going to react to, say, for instance, the polio virus, then if gonorrhea comes by, it goes, yeah, not my problem. Or syphilis, not my problem. COVID, not my problem. HIV, don't recognize you. Nope, don't recognize any of those other things because I am specific only for poliovirus. But specific defenses also have memory. So if poliovirus would come by a second time, those memory cells, the B and T cell memory cells against poliovirus would say, whoa, man, I recognize you from before. I have your number. And it would jump on it right away and have a much more robust defense, much faster than the first time. So that brings us to the term antigen. So recall that an antigen is a specific molecule, think of a protein that the immune system recognizes as foreign. So usually these are things on the outer surface of a bacteria or a virus. So they're fragments, they're not the entire particle. Um, and that is so that the cell can recognize, the B cell or T cell can recognize it there on the surface. It also could be a toxin. Remember when I talked about bacteria producing exotoxins? So it could be a toxin produced by a bacteria that could be the antigen. Or it could be a fragment of one of those parasitic worms. In addition, um, it could just be an abnormal plasma membrane protein, such as we see in our cancer cells. Now, even though I was talking about pathogens when I was talking about gonorrhea and syphilis and COVID and, and malaria, these infectious particles don't have to be pathogens in order to be antigens. So, you know, just keep that in the back of your mind, but realize that, you know, we usually mention pathogens. All right, so if there is an antigen and we have failure of the first and second lines of defense, the body is going to mount an immune response against antigens using our B cells and our T cells. And with the B cells, the way it's going to do is we are gonna produce a protein called an antibody in response to the presence of an antigen. So an antibody is this Y-shaped molecule. And if you look at the arms of the Y, each arm has this long chain or heavy chain and a short or a lighter chain. And if we look at the base of the Y, the base of the Y chain can be attached to the cell that's producing it. And 
the like the B cells that are going to be producing it and the B cells can release them so they can be floating in the interstitial fluid or floating in the blood. They're going to be released by the cells that produce them. And if we look at the short arms, there's a part of it that is variable in nature. And so what that gives us an, is an antigen binding site. It gives us the area of that antibody where the antigen will bind. And this is has a very specific shape that can only bind to that specific antigen that caused it to be produced. So in this case, if this light teal color was the polio virus, the polio virus fits in this antigen binding site. Whereas like if all the other viruses or name another virus, COVID would be this one. And then like green would be gonorrhea and orange would be syphilis. You can see that none of those others would fit in here. And I want you to realize that this shape, this is where it's binding the antigen. And so here it is binding to the antigen on the surface, right there. All right. Now, another word for an antibody is an immuno. Globulin. So it's kind of like the Greek versus Latin, same term for the same thing. And we have five different classes of immune globulins or immunoglobulins. And so these are abbreviated IG for immunoglobulin and then you would think they would be A, B, C, D, E, but they're actually not. Okay, so three of the classes are that simple Y shape. One class are two attached together, what's called a dimer. And one of them is really big. It's a pentamer. It has five Ys attached to each other. And you would think that the simple ones, the simple monomers would be the first ones produced, but you would be wrong. Because in the grand scheme of things, this pentamer, the immunoglobulin, the antibody known as IgM, is actually the first one to appear. And because it's the first one to appear, it's also the first one to disappear. And here's something that's really cool about IgM. Not only can IgM bind to the antibody and do other things, it also can activate one of those particles in complement to make a more robust complement activation so you would get more what were the final particles in the complement cascade cause where you get all those little holes with the perforins and the granzymes to remember those things yeah, go back and review if you don't remember that. Okay, now let's go up and look at IgG up here because IgG, this simple monomer, this is the major type that we're going to produce. We're gonna have much more IgG than anything else. It's the major type in your blood. And the other good thing about IgG is if you are a pregnant mother, it can cross the placenta and will help protect your developing fetus, okay? Um, another type of immunoglobulin is this dimer IgA. This one is found in your secretions, and I mean all your secretions, breast milk if you're a nursing mother. So if mom, if you have a cold and you are breastfeeding, this is gonna help prevent your baby from getting sick. It's also found in your saliva. So if you're kissing a loved one and your loved one is sick, they are transferring antibodies to you as well. It's also found in your tears, in your respiratory tract, your GI tract, and men, yes, also in your semen. The last one I want to talk about is IgE because IgE is found on mast cells. Do you remember what cell we say, which of the five white blood cells when it goes into tissue we call a mast cell? It's 
the one that's filled with histamine granules because it's going to give us an allergic response. So if you don't know, please stop and remember which one it is. IgG, I'm not going to talk about in this course. So you can just kind of ignore it just as far as we're concerned. All right, continuing on with the setup of things you need to know about, there are things called cytokines. And cytokines basically are these proteins which are secreted by other cells. So yes, some of our endothelial cells and some fibroblasts can secrete them, but mostly we are talking other immune cells. So look at all of your leukocytes. They're all going to be secreting them. And what cytokines do is they basically will stimulate other cells of the immune system to perform their various functions. So if you remember how um, hormones of the endocrine system work, um, okay, so instead of traveling the bloodstream long distance, think of these would be like paracrine, okay? Only some cytokines would have an autocrine function as well, okay? So whatever the stimulus is to the cytokine producing cell, it releases cytokines and binds to a receptor. So cytokines cannot cross the plasma membrane at the target cell. So they have to bind to a receptor. And basically that's gonna cause signaling of that cell to cause their effect within that cell. We don't need to know how that happens in this course. All right. So examples of cytokines, names of cytokines, which you may learn in this lecture or in later lectures are things called interferon. And there's more than one type of interferon, but right now we're just gonna call it interferon. Interleukins, there's a lot of different kinds of interleukins. Interferons, by the way, you may see abbreviated in pictures as IF. Interleukins, you may see abbreviated as IL, then a dash, one, two, three, four, five, six. And tumor necrosis factor, which you may see abbreviated as TNF later on. Okay, so generally, what can cytokines do? Well, cytokines are important um, when we're talking about how T cells are going to be interacting with B cells. They also have to do with how T cells interact with each other. They also have to do with how B cells and T cell clones are growing. And they also can stimulate other cytokines to be produced or they can inhibit cells from releasing other cytokines. So as you can see, cytokines actually have a lot to do with affecting other immune cells and what they do in the immune response. So we'll talk about just a couple of them because this is a very basic introduction. Okay. So let's talk about what happens with B cells and how B cells are going to be activated because we can kind of talk about what B cells need to do in order to do their job in the immune system. And the first thing that needs to happen is they need to get activated. So here we have a couple of B cells and you can see sitting here on the surface, there's two different kinds of receptors. Okay, this one's got like this little pink Y thing and this one has this little blue, different kind of Y thing. And as I said before, the antigen can only bind to the receptor of its type of receptor. So only that one type of B cell. In this case, it's this upper one with this pink, more rigid kind of Y. Okay. So when it binds to its receptor, it activates that B cell. Okay. And this picture is showing that, yes, there's some cytokines over here that were helping this activation. Now, once that cell is activated, what is going to happen is it's like it's putting its finger on the Xerox machine. It's going to make copies of itself, and that is called cloning. And most of these cloned B cells are going to be called cells called plasma cells. So let's talk about what a plasma cell is, and then I'll come back and talk about cloning again. So here are plasma cells. So as you can see, a plasma cell doesn't exactly look like a B cell, okay? Because remember, B cells are round cells, and between 70 90% of the cell was a nucleus. But in a plasma cell, it's a little bit more oval, 
and looks kind of more like a hard boiled egg with the nucleus pushed over to the side. And that's because the plasma cell is chock full of rough endoplasmic reticulum. And if you remember what rough endoplasmic reticulum had, it was studded with ribosomes. And do you remember what ribosomes did? Yes, this is where proteins were. So basically the plasma cell has become a protein factory and the plasma cells are circulating in your blood and your lymph and they're going to become a protein factory and the specific type of protein plasma cells make are antibodies, also known as immunoglobulins. So here is a plasma cell in your blood. Do you see how it looks like a heart belt egg? with the nucleus pushed all over to the side because it's chock full of rough endoplasmic reticulum. So remember that. So it's going to produce and secrete massive amounts of antibodies, but only antibodies to a specific antigen. Now, what specific antigen you may ask? Well, it's secreting antibodies identical to the B cell receptor of the activated B cell. So if we go back here, identical to this receptor that the antigen bound to. Yes, that's what it's producing. And so we say it is a mono, monoclonal antibody, meaning... All the antibodies are of one clone. They're all going to be derived from the same B cell. So in other words, antibodies against measles would not work against chickenpox. Antibodies against polio would not work against gonorrhea or against syphilis or against COVID or against HIV. Okay, so getting back to clonal expansion, as I mentioned before, cytokines from the help from T cells. We haven't learned about T cells yet, but cytokines from T cells are going to help those B cells get stimulated. Yes. So basically, it's like if the B cells are sitting there and they're looking there and there's antibodies, yeah, some B cells can get activated, but it's kind of like with the cytokines from the helper T cells, it's like turning the fire on the pot on high and boiling it to really activate those B cells. And now we are going to be cloning it and depending on what message they are getting from cell signaling, Beyond the scope of this class, they will either become plasma cells churning out massive amounts of antibodies specific to this antigen, or they will become memory B cells, memory B cells that can only make antibodies specific to that antigen. Now, when that antigen is taken care of, we don't want to have millions and millions of those plasma cells left over. That would not be a good thing. So whoever designed you was brilliant. And not only related to immunity, but related to many things in your body. The process known as apoptosis can occur. So say that word, apoptosis. And apoptosis is pre-programmed cell suicide. Yes. So after this infection is over, the plasma cells that are left in the clone will undergo apoptosis. So here's what happens. Imagine this is a plasma cell. Okay, so it doesn't exactly look like a plasma cell, but imagine it is. Okay, and it's undergoing apoptosis. So that nucleus is kind of condensing down on itself. And then parts of that cytoplasm are start sticking out, looking like little blebs. And the nucleus is going to really condense down and get really dark. And those little blebs of the cytoplasm are going to start pinching off, becoming these little bodies separating from the main thing. And eventually you're going to end up with all these little pieces of cell, all this little cellular debris and all this little nuclear debris. Can you see all this little debris here? And so our friendly little macrophages are going to come up like Roomba vacuum cleaners. And they are going to have a buffet. 
Okay, so here's an actual cell. So this cell has already started the process of apoptosis because you can see the little blood thing sticking out already. And then you can see even more. And then here you have apop bodies sticking out already. So we are ready for some phagocytosis to occur. So this keeps the body healthy. This is actually, we can do this with cells. This helps prevent you from getting autoimmune diseases, can get rid of damaged cells. Do you remember in utero, if you ever saw pictures of yourself in utero, you had webbed fingers. Well, the way you got rid of your webbing was all those cells disappeared through this process of apoptosis. So it happens, it's normal part of your body. There's nothing abnormal about it. So learn that term. All right, so let's put this process of B cells and antibody mediated immunity all on one slide for you. Here's our naive B cell. In other words, this is a B cell that's just kind of hanging around, waiting. Waiting, waiting, waiting. It's sitting in one of those places like a lymph node or a nodule, maybe in a Peyer's patch, maybe in your tonsil, someplace in your body, just waiting to be called to duty. Hasn't had to work yet. It's had its education, but it hasn't had to work yet. When all of a sudden, its receptor binds to a specific antigen. And so that B cell gets activated, goes under mitosis, has some clonal expansion. We're going to get plasma cells being formed, making a whole bunch of antibodies, and we're also going to be forming memory B cells. So what's going to happen with those antibodies? Well, before I tell you, I need you to remember and to make note of that with B cells and with antibody mediated immunity, the B cell itself was able to directly recognize the antigen because this is not going to be the case with our T cells. Okay. So what happens with the antibody? Well, it's kind of like the B cell releases the and they can go on and they are going to bind to antigens on the surface of the cells, of those target cells. Okay, so here's the B cell, became a plasma cell, released the antibodies, and here we can see antibodies in this case binding to antigens. This bacterium has one bound to it. This one has four bound to it. The macrophage comes along and is saying, yum, yum, time to eat, undergoing that process. Don't forget the word for that. When you are eating, it's going to be phagocytosis. Need to know that term. So let me give you some examples of antibody antigen reactions. So AB is the abbreviation for antibody. It doesn't have to be a capital A. It can be a lowercase a, as you'll see later on in the slide. AG is the abbreviation for antigen. Doesn't matter if you make it antibody antigen or if you make it antigen antibody. It's the same thing, just like two times three. It's the same as three times two. So... What has to happen to have an antibody antigen reaction is the antibodies have to bind to the antigen on the surface of the target cell. And so now it's marked them for destruction. And if you were taking microbiology or immunology, you would learn half a dozen different ways in detail how this would, how those target cells would be destroyed. But let me just give you a little preview. The first thing is, maybe we don't even have to destroy it because if we have enough antibodies that can completely coat the surface, then we can neutralize it. Say for instance, bacteria is completely coated, then this bacteria cannot invade and destroy tissue. It's just kind of like sitting there. And maybe our body can wall it off and it's not going to cause any kind of inflammatory reaction. All right, another example is the antibody coating always makes it easier, almost always makes it easier for a macrophage to recognize that cell 
or that particle, because it could be an exotoxin or it could be a viral particle. So it could be engulfed through phagocytosis. It's kind of like shining a light or making a neon sun and says, can you see me now, Mr. Macrophage, come get me. Or the third one, which I alluded to before, was it what the antibody binds to an antigen, it can activate complement. And if it activates complement, it could result in formation of the membrane attack complex. And then water goes in and then it bursts, killing that. All right, so here's a review slide. So you need to stop before you go on to the next video. All right, so most of the things I put words across. So make sure you label all the steps, cell types, what is happening, and then after this, name the final step that must happen, et cetera. Make sure you understand all of this extremely well before you go on to T cells, please. All right, thank you so much for all your hard work and I will see you shortly. My mouse went dead right in the middle of this talk. <laughs>